In this chapter, we're going to talk about network robustness. So up to this point, we've talked a lot about how networks evolve and how they form. And we've also discussed the different types of networks and the properties of each. So, and those include random networks and different kinds of real world networks, like scale free networks. But we haven't really asked ourselves, how do networks respond to either random failures or coordinated attacks? So first of all, what does it mean to be robust? When we think about things that are robust, they're strong and healthy, vigorous. If we're talking about an object, we could mean it's sturdy in construction, so like a robust metal cabinet. We can also consider the robustness of a process, system, or organization. You've probably considered this in your own business, that if it is robust, it's able to withstand or to overcome adverse conditions. Robustness uh, means oak in Latin which is a symbol of strength and longevity in the ancient world. You can think about how strong an oak tree is as a symbol of robustness. So what we want to know is how robust are different kinds of networks? And in particular, how robust are they against different types of errors? And what can we do to make a network robust? How can we design structurally a network that will not be as susceptible to either random failure or to attack. So fortunately, most complex systems maintain their basic functions even when they experience errors or failures. So if you think about cells, we have a lot of different mutations that can happen and a lot of errors, but we often don't notice their consequences. Similarly, the way the internet is designed, we have lots of different interconnected routers that are decentralized. At any moment, we could have hundreds of broken routers, but we don't have the effect of the entire internet shutting down. There's not some kind of centralized location um, where you can just flip a switch off and all of a sudden the internet breaks. And so where does this robustness come from? Well, in most complex systems, we have different kinds of feedback loops that keep tab on the components and the system's health. So we ask ourselves, could network structure affect a system's robustness? In order to get into this topic, we're actually going to go back to physics again and take a look at something called percolation theory. So percolation theory deals mainly with what you'll see in your textbook are these square lattices. And so these are pretty structurally regular types of networks. So as your textbook describes it, we can use percolation theory to look at how different nodes belong to different clusters, and then in reverse, what happens as you start to remove nodes from the lattice. And similar to that phase transition we saw when we were talking about the giant component and a connected graph as we have growth and preferential attachment, we see the same effect as we start to remove nodes from a lattice. These aren't square lattices here, but you can see the effect that here we have all of the nodes connected and we start to kind of take nodes out of the network and we remove this node. We, we see that we actually still have everybody connected, but as we start to remove additional nodes, we start to lose the giant component. Here, I would still argue that we have a giant connected component, but as we remove that third node, we end up with a lot of disjoint sets of nodes and edges, and we lose the giant component. And similarly to how we talked about it forming, when we were talking about growth and preferential attachment, the breakdown of a network as described by percolation theory is exactly the same, assuming that it is a square lattice. So here you can see more specifically what I'm talking about. They're calling this inverse percolation. So percolation theory explaining how nodes are part of clusters in the lattice and inverse percolation showing the breakdown and the kind of sudden loss of the giant component, just like we had talked about before. And so we have this result for a square lattice, but 
this is just the theoretical drive for understanding how we might look at networks breaking down. Obviously, real world networks, for the most part, aren't designed in this way. However, as we can see here, uh, for random networks, given what we know about them, that in random networks, if you pick a node at random, it's likely to have the average degree of the network. Random networks actually follow this same progress in network breakdown. So in other words, there's a finite fraction of nodes at which we lose the giant component. So in a square lattice and a random network. And so the important thing that I want you to take away here is that if we have this kind of topology, so we either have a square lattice or a random network, we're going to have this result where we keep removing nodes from the network and we're removing those nodes at random. These are just random failures that eventually the giant component that we have will disappear. But the question is, does this kind of behavior occur in a scale free network, which is more likely to be what our real world network is? And the answer we're going to find is no. So now that we've had a little bit of theoretical motivation, let's talk about the robustness of scale free networks. So, so far we've been talking about random failures. So we have a network and nodes just turn off at random. They disappear at random. So maybe a router's failed in the internet, something like that. And we've been discussing them in terms of either a random network or square lattice. Now we're going to ask ourselves what happens if we have random failure in a scale free network? Well, if we remember the degree distribution of a scale free network, we have a whole bunch of nodes that have very small degree and we have just a couple of nodes that have a very large degree. And those are our hubs. So getting back to one of the basic concepts that we've been talking about throughout the course. And so if we take away a node at random, the likelihood of removing a hub from the network is pretty small because there's only a few of them. It's much more likely that if we take away a node at random, that it's going to be one of the many nodes that only has a small degree. Now, if we go along with what percolation theory was saying. Percolation theory tells us that we should have some critical moment when the network that we have breaks down completely and we lose the giant component. The math behind it, if we apply it to a scale free network in the way it's set up, actually gives us an interesting result. And that is that the fraction of nodes to be removed would have to be a hundred percent. And so this means that actually in order to fragment the network, if it's scale free, we would have to remove every single node, mathematically speaking. So we will see some kind of effect on the giant component before then, but it's really predicted not to completely vanish until we've actually taken away all the nodes in the network. And we can see that happening here. So we're not going after hubs or anything like that. We're just randomly removing nodes from the network. And you can see that as this process moves along, that we have to actually remove quite a few nodes in order to have this breakdown. Now we have a way to talk about the integrity of a scale free network called the Molloy Reed criterion. The Molloy Reed criterion says that in order to have a giant component, every node in a randomly connected network has to be connected to at least two other nodes on average. So a way of thinking about this metaphorically is if you have a bunch of people and you want them all to be joined in a circle, that everyone would have to join hands with at least two other people. And so what this does is it links the integrity of the network to the presence or absence of a giant component. 
and again, more specifically in a scale-free network because of how it's set up, we actually would have to remove all of the nodes in a scale-free network before it would become fragmented. It's that strong. And so again, we have this result that if we just have random failures, that a scale-free network is actually very strong. And we see this, and you've probably seen this in real world networks that are scale free. Just having a couple of random failures or even a lot of random failures is not going to shut the entire network down. And that's related to it having a giant component as well as the likelihood of removing a hub from the network is very small. So scale free networks appear to be very robust. They can handle random failure. However, can they handle a coordinated attack? Are they tolerant to attacks? So we saw the behavior of the network as it experienced random failures. Let's take a look at what happens if we have a coordinated attack on a hub. So here we start to remove the biggest nodes in the network and you can see that the behavior is much different. We actually start to lose that giant component right away. So the Achilles heel of scale-free networks is coordinated attacks. And we bring back this threshold that we saw in percolation theory. And what we find is that, again, have a finite number of hubs that we need to remove, and then we will have a fragmented network. The likelihood of this happening after the removal of one hub isn't that large, but as we start to continue to remove hubs from the network, this is the result that we see. And you can kind of think about maybe a product that's endorsed by different celebrities. If they start to jump ship for whatever reason, then maybe the popularity of the product goes down. Something along those lines. Doesn't necessarily happen after one influential person leaves, but after a couple do, it becomes hard for that network to recover. So in 1959, a man named Paul Baran was a, an engineer at RAND, and he was tasked with figuring out how to develop a communications network that could survive a nuclear attack from the Soviet Union. And so he started to think about, well, what kind of network would be strong against this kind of attack? And what he decided was this kind of star layout where you have a central control center and different nodes coming off of it, this would be very weak because you take out the central node and then all the communication actually breaks down. He then also considered what he called a hierarchical structure of stars connected in the form of a larger star. This is what we refer to today as a hub and spoke network. And it's very close to what we would call a scale free network today. He also thought that this would be a little too susceptible. And so what he proposed was this kind of distributed mesh network. Notice it's not a square lattice. It looks more like mesh. And he found that this would actually be the strongest against this kind of attack. So you can see that if different nodes fail, even if one is targeted, that there are other ways through the network. And so communication can still exist within the network. And so this helped inform network integrity as we know it today. One of the other types of network issues you've probably heard of or have seen, and that is what's referred to as a cascading failure. So when we have a cascading failure, you have something a little bit different than just random node removal and attacks. What you have is maybe a random failure or an attack that then leads to a much larger event as different nodes are affected by the initial shock of that failure or attack in the network. And so a good example of this kind of failure is a blackout. So in Canada, they had had a power network that looked up and running like this after a failure that led to a lot of different cascading failures, they ended up having a very large power outage. 
Other types of cascading failures you can think about include denial of service attacks. So if a particular site is affected and routers try to route to neighboring routers, then they're just sending a lot of traffic a different way and potentially inducing a series of denial of service attacks throughout the internet. Financial crises also fall under the category of cascading failures. You can think about different financial crises that we've had in history, as well as say the run on the bank movie, It's a Wonderful Life. So how can we ensure that a network is robust? Well, we have an issue here because we talked about how scale-free networks are very robust to random failure. And so we can think about how that type of network is designed, but actually a more random style network is going to be less susceptible to an attack because every node is just about as important as every other node. And so we have this trade-off of cost in terms of setting up a network to be robust. It's costly to try and connect everything. We can't necessarily do that. But the more we make it centralized or scale-free, the more likely it is going to be susceptible to attack. So what we want to do is balance this hub and spoke topology with a more connected network and try to balance susceptibleness to failures and attacks as well as cost. So in summary, some of the things that we talked about looked at the theoretical background for talking about network robustness being percolation theory. And if we have a square lattice or a random network, we have this critical threshold at which we lose our giant component. This we don't have in a scale-free network. We have the Molloy Reed criterion that is related to the integrity of a network based on whether or not it has a giant component. And so it'll have a giant component if every node has on average at least two neighbors. We also talked about how scale-free networks are very strong against random failure, but very weak to coordinated attacks. We took a look at the nature of cascading failure and talked a little bit about how to make a network robust. So some of the other aspects of making a strong network are shown here. We have a robust network or system if it can maintain basic functions in the presence of different kinds of errors. So communications network, for example, would still be able to get information across, even if some of its nodes or links were missing. We can talk about network resilience. So network's resilient if it can adapt to different errors by changing how it operates. So the ability to change how a network's core activities are done. And then finally, we can build in redundancy into the network where we have parallel components and functions that if we lose some component or some function, we can make up for that in some way because of redundancy. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how we can build robustness in networks and what scale-free networks, real-world networks are most susceptible to.